Welcome. Welcome. In the interest of, uh, there are only yep. two or three things worthwhile in my brief, unspectacular military career that I learned. One was uh, the P-38 can opener. It's one of the great inventions of all time. The other was military time, like, you know, 1,000, 1,300, 1,500, it makes a lot of sense. And the other was to be where I'm supposed to be five minutes before I'm supposed to be. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot of trouble with that during the time I spent in Nicaragua, but it's still ingrained in me. So we're going to begin, and especially because uh, some people have parking uh, 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 meters to uh, keep an eye or an ear on. And uh, so I can't thank you enough for, uh, for coming to hear about something that is not really up on everybody's radar today, uh, but to me is, is very important and is another example of how history teaches us things about what's going on uh, today. Uh, a, couple, a couple of housekeeping items and introductions. We've got uh, pop over there on ice in the sink. So that's the coldest. Help yourself to that. And there's also more pop in the, in the uh, refrigerator. Uh, I will be, uh, this is the first talk that I have ever given of the many I've given in which I have actually inched my way into the 20th century uh, 18 years after it ended. So I have a few slides today. I'm very proud of that. There are only, there are only six of them. Uh, my, uh, my wife, Elizabeth Bennett, will, will be uh, obeying the commands to move the slides around and that will all work. Uh, I have another uh, uh, new friend I want to introduce you to. Uh, I have been uh, sort of the Victoria contact for uh, white poppies for some years now. Uh, sometimes I got them directly from England and sometimes from a, cu a couple that's over in Vancouver. But by good fortune, I met uh, Sam Beckman here not long ago. And uh, Sam is uh, quite active in the, in the White Poppy campaign and in other matters for peace. And so we're really glad to have him added to the community. Uh, and he is going to be filming things today and putting it on Facebook and YouTube and uh, so we'll be, uh, we'll be all right there. And I also want to thank, and there's, a, there's an irony here, uh, I had this poster. I asked uh, Magritte Gordonier here, who is a shining light in the, in the peace movement here. Uh, I asked Magritte to make a, a poster, and I, I sent a uh, picture of some UN things, and for some reason she couldn't use that. And, uh, and so she said, is this one all right? And I said, sure, that, that's fine. So about two days ago, I looked at this poster, and the ironic thing about the poster is that if you look closely here, this guy is in the 82nd Airborne Division. Oh, so no. I can assure you that whatever these people were doing, it was not peacekeeping. <laughs> because that's my unit, the 82nd Airborne Division. And I'm fairly, I'm fairly familiar with, uh, uh, with their activities. Uh, so I, uh, uh, and I uh, wear that uniform, that old uniform top, in every uh, talk or event that I do around the book, uh, The Case for stay, Staying Out of Other People's Wars. But this is not a book event. You're more than welcome if you don't have a copy of the book uh, <laughs> to purchase one today. But uh, this is not a, uh, a purely book selling event by any means. Uh, I brought the, the, uh, the uniform this time because of this thing on the poster uh, <clears throat> with, uh, with the 82nd. So uh, the explanation, though, for why I wear the, that uh, uniform is the same. And that is I, my commitment now at my advanced age is in remembrance in, in large part of uh, friends in the Army that I had that I buried with full military honors during the Vietnam era who died for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, so that is what reminds me uh, of why I'm doing this. Uh, I'm here, I've had a full life, they're gone. <clears throat> I also want to mention that this, 
talk is part of a, uh, an ongoing uh, series sponsored by the Vancouver Island Peace and Disarmament Network. There are a number of events that have already taken place and not others that are scheduled throughout the year. Uh, you can go to VIPDN.org and catch <coughs> uh, notices of uh, upcoming events. This talk today is part of, of that. In the interest of time uh, today, uh, I, must, I have to assume uh, that you all, and I think it's a good assumption, that you all are not entirely uh, ignorant of Canadian experiences, including Canadian experiences in peacekeeping. Uh, and I'm not going to detail those situations, uh, but you can, you, if you have questions, in addition to asking me, there are people like uh, uh, Mary Wynn and Wendy and Magritte and Daphne uh, here, and, and, and there's a lot of detail in the book, of course, as well. So I'm going to be assuming some knowledge on your part as I go uh, forward. And although it's not in the, the headlines these days, peacekeeping in Canada is at a crossroads. And, and it's important that the public step in and prevent the wholesale perversion of a proud Canadian tradition, in my view. And the perversion of language paves the way for the perversion of action. And that is what I see happening in Canada today. Uh, one example, last year, uh, John McKay, the, the parliamentary secretary for the uh, Minister of Defense, came out to a town hall meeting in Sydney. And when he was asked a question about peacekeeping, he pointed as examples to the Canadian military officers who were advising the Iraqi armed forces in the war in the Middle East. That was peacekeeping, and he called them warrior diplomats. So the language, if we get people to believing that that's what peacekeeping is, uh, I think it's important uh, uh, to challenge that. Uh, that's only one example of how uh, the Canadian military hierarchy, and I'm not talking about ordinary Canadian soldiers, I want to be very clear about that, that but the military hierarchy is uh, developing a formula for disguising what is just another form of war making. And the upcoming mission in Mali is another example of how the generals have sold this deception to the Canadian government. And as we'll see, whatever Mali is, it's not uh, peacekeeping. Now, as I was researching Canada, the case for staying out of other people's wars, uh, there was a whole lot I did not know. I did not know, for example, that the stories of Suez and Cyprus and the Balkans and Rwanda, and particularly Afghanistan, yeah. would reveal the formula for distorting and undermining the concept of peacekeeping. Uh, but I also didn't know that those stories and others would reveal elements of a unique contribution to saving lives that Canada could offer the world. And we are for sure on those two matters at a crossroads. Down one path uh, lies more public deception and allegiance to the United States and to the United States-led violence. And down the other lies truly humanitarian peacekeeping. <clears throat> so we're going to look at Canadian peacekeeping. Uh, yesterday offers the world something to be proud of but also how that promise <coughs> is being thwarted. And since Canadian peacekeeping tomorrow is up to us, I'd like for that to be, in addition to your questions, a discussion among us about how we might influence Canada's path. Uh, two caveats before we dive in. Uh, I'm, as I've mentioned, a U.S. Army veteran and a lawyer who's career has been in both areas involved with human to human violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I speak today only about peacekeeping with a military component. In fact, nonviolent interventions into conflict zones mm -hmm. have perhaps even greater potential. Uh, to pursue that subject 
uh, please think about organizing an event like this for my colleague Yesher Moser Mokwan, who uh, is an expert in the area. Together we drafted the Green Party of Canada uh, policy on peace and human security, and it includes recommendations for Canadian policy and activities to assist nonviolent interventions. And also the works of Dr. John Rohr, who uh, spoke recently, and my car had broken down and I wasn't able to attend, but another, their <coughs> expertise in nonviolent uh, conflict intervention. So today, I'm dealing with the world the way it is, and the immediate threat to turn peacekeeping into war making by deception. Uh, second caveat is that my analysis is biased. My overwhelming bias is toward humanitarian action and prevention of civilian deaths and displacements. That is more important to me than the defeat of any enemy or Canada's place on the world stage or any other uh, factor. So protecting and assisting civilians caught up in violent conflicts should be the touchstone of any peacekeeping activity or policy. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about uh, peacekeeping yesterday. By the way, the person I just referred to you <laughs> for <laughs> expertise in nonviolent conflict <laughs> intervention just, uh, just arrived. <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about Canadian peacekeeping yesterday. Uh, some basics. Peacekeeping is an omnibus, ominous, obscure term covering many kinds of intervention circumstances and it's open to many interpretations and that means it's open to the kind of deception and perversion that I'm trying to alert people to today. <clears throat> uh, also, a basic matter is that there are a number of reasons I think that Canadian generals in the upper echelon of the Canadian military prefer war making to peacekeeping. One of them, several reasons, is that peacekeeping is quite a bit more complex than war making we'll see. It's more challenging. If your government's going to give you people and hardware and weapons, it's relatively simple to get from A to B and kill people. I, I fairly well uh, I'll tell you that's not hard, but peacekeeping, as we'll see, is quite a more challenging uh, proposition. And the third of the basics, as we begin to, to look at yesterday, today, and tomorrow in peacekeeping, is that there is a holy trinity in peacekeeping. And my assistant now will remind us of that. Yes, it is uh, consent, impartiality, and minimal use of force. And in today's world, with the legacy of colonialism, each of these elements presents formidable challenges. But the experience of Canadians yesterday provides valuable keys for meeting those challenges. So let's start there. Let's start with yesterday. Let's start with the one that Canadians wave the flag for the most. Everybody knows. Lester Pearson and Suez. Okay. It's worthwhile to remember uh, this is a lesson, among other things, about consent uh, and Canadian contribution. Uh, the UNEF, United Nations Ex emergency force, Lester Pearson persuaded the UN to authorize, winning him the Nobel Peace Prize, was deployed with no user's manual and no de de detailed mandate about what to do. And in fact, Pearson wrote, the birth of that force had been sudden and had been surgical, and the arrangements for reception of the infant were rudimentary, and the midwives had no precedence of genuine experience to guide them. So. We're talking about a blank page now. And the commander of the uh, uh, Canadian, uh, was a Canadian, uh, General E.L.M. Tommy Burns, uh, who uh, commanded the uh, force, but there were no Canadian troops. Why were there no Canadian troops in this great uh, uh, enterprise? Consent is part of the answer. The Suez dispute, arose out of British reluctance to let go of its one of its <coughs> greater imperial dreams, uh, Cape Town to Cairo uh, uh, and the Suez Canal. Uh, but the Canadians 
Canadian forces at that time wore British uniforms. Very bad optics for, uh, for peacekeeping. Uh, so, and the reluctance of Nasser and the Egyptians, and later on, as we will see, uh, to have peacekeepers wearing the uniforms of their oppressors is perfectly understandable. Uh, so Suez immediately raised the, the question of the meaning and scope of consent. NASA says, okay, peacekeeping force can come in. Is that the whole answer? Uh, but Burns and Pearson and other Canadians were influential in diplomatically sorting that out. Nasser had agreed to the presence of UNEF, but had he given operational consent? Who would have the final word on what the force would do on the ground? Uh, one example of working this out diplomatically was uh, that the British were afraid that their Egyptian uh, uh, cooperators would be murdered uh, as, as collaborators, and so they organized, uh, the force organized joint Egyptian peacekeeper patrols to go around and, and allay that concern of the British. That's just one of many examples of making up stuff on the ground without any, uh, without any uh, user's manual. Now, Suez didn't present every problem that peacekeepers would face in the future by any means. For example, at the time of this uh, force, uh, Burns was supervising an armistice in the conflict between Egypt and Israel, which arose from Israel's expulsion of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, the geography in that conflict at least was settled. That is, it was possible to put peacekeepers interposed between two fairly static warring factions. Uh, that would not be the case later on, for example, in Cyprus, where the, where the situation was much more fluid on the ground and certainly not in the case of the former Soviet colonies in the Balkans, where consent broke down even before uh, the peacekeeping force arrived. But in any event, this Suez uh, beginning that we're all so proud of did give the combatants 10 years to work things out. Uh, and Canadians were important authors of the first pages of that peacekeeper's user's manual especially in real diplomacy and not warrior diplomat uh, diplomacy. So talking now about impartiality and minimal use of force, the other prongs of the, <coughs> of the peacekeeping trinity, and we talk about these together because they are so closely uh, related. The actuality or even the appearance of partiality raises the danger. Uh, that force will not be minimal, that the peacekeepers will be attacked, that humanitarian assistance will be prevented. So uh, impartiality and minimal use of force are very closely linked. And there are really two chapters to the story of the Balkans uh, that uh, tell us both on something about what Canadians have contributed and still have available to the world and how things are going to be undermined and perverted. So that's a very, it's a very interesting crossroads story. Yugoslavia was another ill-advised creation of the great war victors, and that's another story for another time. But it came apart, and the Serbs and Croats declared, declared their own nation, <coughs> and uh, with uh, a Muslim community right in the middle of it uh, as well, uh, and the UN brokered consent for UN Pro 4, United Nations Protection Force. I think I'm just going to forget about the acronyms from here on out. Just call them the Peacekeeping Force. Yeah. There, there are some tongue-tied acronyms to be dealt with here. Uh, a contingent of 14,000 troops, including 1,200 Canadians, for the purpose of protecting civilians. By the time the force arrived, however, a full-scale civil war was underway, and both sides were very well trained and very well armed and very hostile to one another. And not only that, to add to the challenge, in a preview of the challenges of today, including Mali, uh, some of those forces were militias, 
who either did not get the word or did not care to pay attention to com uh, orders from their commanders. So imagine the difficulty of peacekeeping in that sort of a, uh, <coughs> of a uh, context. Uh, this mission, in short, was a great test of impartiality and minimal use of force. Mm -hmm. And again, there was no template. Uh, again, Canadians would be instrumental in providing uh, examples of intelligent use of discretion on the ground required to preserve these elements of the Trinity as much as was possible uh, because suspicions were rampant. Uh, each claim of partiality to one side or another uh, raised, as I've said, the danger that humanitarian uh, efforts would be blocked or uh, peacekeepers would be attacked, or both. Uh, so without any special knowledge or guidance, uh, Canadian ground commanders who, as I say, knew when to hold them and knew when to fold them, were invaluable to the humanitarian mission uh, in the Balkans. And I'll give you four quick examples. Uh, one of them is from earlier in Cyprus, but it's the same kind of thing. Uh, the Turks at war with the Greeks, the Turks were firing on a hotel that had civilians uh, in it. Instead of choosing sides and fighting back against the Turks, the Canadian commander uh, negotiated towards the idea of a convoy to get the civilians out of the hotel. Uh, he managed to do that and immediately then declared the hotel to be a UN uh, protected uh, location, ran a flag up and patrolled it and decided it was going to be uh, defended. In the Balkans, uh, there was a, a, a mission to deliver food to Muslims outside Sarajevo, a humanitarian mission. And the Serbs stopped that convoy several times uh, and demanded to inspect the vehicles in the convoy. Instead of relying on uh, legalities or whatever, the, the, the Canadian commander said fine. And, acquiesced in all the, all the uh, inspections uh, of the convoy and it got through. The humanitarian aid got through. Another commander with insufficient uh, ammunition and equipment was confronted uh, with a military threat from, I think it was from the Serbs, it could have been from, from either side, uh, and he saw that uh, if there was a fight there were going to be casualties uh, and that was going to increase the hostility on both sides of having seen their people killed. And so he just surrendered because he knew that was going to be the outcome anyway and he wanted to avoid that, uh, that uh, unnecessary hostility. Uh, another commander, however, had a rule that uh, if his force was, was uh, not heavily outnumbered, he would stand his ground and do his job and that you'll just have to deal with it. So uh, there's one other very important example of this kind of use of discretion uh, without any guidance, uh, and that's General, the, another Canadian general, uh, Louis Mackenzie. Uh, he brokered in Sarajevo uh, uh, an opening of the Sarajevo airport by the Serb forces who controlled it so the humanitarian aid could get in. Now to do that, he, he had to uh, agreed to allow the Serbs to evacuate their wounded across that airport, which saved them a long round trip over the mountains. Uh, and the Serbs had to agree that those ambulances could be inspected so there weren't any weapons in it. So that's the kind of stuff on the ground uh, that Canadians have, uh, have contributed to in trying to preserve as much of the, uh, the Trinity as possible. Negotiate remain impartial, bluff sometimes, save lives. Mm -hmm. So Canadians added to the storehouse of peacekeeping expertise as they continued to write the book on how the Trinity works on the ground. And in countless little encounters like this, Canadians contributed to minimizing combat, knowing that each time they failed to do so, the adversary would claim it as an example of UN partiality toward the other side. Now this effort was far, far from perfect, but lives were saved, thousands of lives were saved.
Bill, could I just ask you? Yes. You're, you're still referring to the Trinity as the approach that was taken in the past. Yes, I, well, I, I'm saying that there are instances where it's appropriate today and that in, in instances more than uh, just the pure uh, dividing line Suez kinds of things, mm -hmm. that there are instances where it can be preserved, not perfectly, but, uh, but comparatively better than going to war for one side or the other. And that's what we're going to see. That's what worries me about Mali, as we will, as we will see. But a, you know, a good question. So, uh, so the second half of the Bosnian story uh, the, uh, has serious implications, unfortunately, for peacekeeping today. Uh, propaganda eventually identified the Serbs as the only bad guys. Now they were not, hmm. but that became the dominant, uh, the dominant propaganda theme. Uh, once this happened, NATO, led by the U.S., decided that rather than increase the effectiveness of peacekeepers, they would choose sides and settle matters themselves. So the anachronistic U.N. Security Council, dominated by NATO member countries who are themselves dominated by the United States, denied requests for additional troops to protect civilians, but approved a no-fly zone over Bosnia. And NATO immediately accepted the authorization to enforce it. And so thereafter, the U.S. Uh, at Dayton, Ohio, essentially imposed terms on the parties uh, and sent in 60,000 troops, including Canadians, to enforce those terms. And the Canadian fighter jets were part of a 78-day campaign that killed thousands, displaced 600,000 civilians, and created a million refugees. So the major powers in Bosnia too, had no money for peacekeeping, but they did not scrimp on their war. So in the 90s then, from a blank page, fashioning diplomacy and ground level rules and practice to serve as much as the, of the, preserve as much of the Trinity as possible was what Canadians contributed to. But we also see early signs that peacekeeping will turn into a facade for today's ongoing post-colonial power struggle. Mm -hmm. across, around the globe. And these signs became, early signs became alarm bells in Rwanda and Afghanistan. So it's difficult to talk about Rwanda, and I, and I know many of those of you who know a little bit about it uh, agree with me. Uh, at this stage, one could have hoped, perhaps, with our prior experience, mm -hmm. that peacekeeping would, one, be confined to UN missions, it would be impartial, it would have humanitarian relief as its overriding purpose, and it would feature military forces with sufficient strength and commitment to act in immediate self-defense, but no more than that, in pursuit of humanitarian goals. That was the vision, and Rwanda cast doubt on every aspect of that vision. And it also illustrates the generally racist nature of peacekeeping decisions so far. Before and after the Great War, Africans have been treated badly <coughs> by the major powers. That's an understatement. Before and after the Great War, black lives haven't mattered. The driving force in this racist approach is, no surprise, the United States. Rwanda was a child of German and Belgian uh, imperialism. Uh, Belgium colonial governments had elevated the minority Tutsi tribe over the rival Hutus because they had lighter skins. I'm not kidding. Later, in a coup, uh, the majority took over, uh, the Hutus took over and began to extract revenge that became a genocide of 800,000 men, women, and children. And I noted uh, that the kill rate in this genocide was five times the rate in, of killing in the Holocaust. So, so this, is what we are, this is what we are dealing with. And into this hell, then, the UN authorized a puny force of 2,500 troops uh, commanded by Canadian General Romeo Dallaire mm -hmm. and one Canadian deputy, Brent Beardsley. Canada refused to supply troops. Dallaire was told that the U.S. nominated Security Council would veto anything that was not small and cheap. 
Mm -hmm. And these orders were coming out from a country that was a half a billion dollars in debt to the UN at the, you know, at mm -hmm. the time. As the scope of the slaughter became uh, evident, the U.S. continued to thwart every effort to save lives in Rwanda. Uh, they, they nitpicked over the term genocide because if you accept something as genocide, it has international law implications. They even De defended, the Hutus were broadcasting over the radio targets where to go and who to kill, and uh, the Americans defended that on free speech grounds. Uh, so Rwanda you know, gave us several lessons about peacekeeping tomorrow, and one is clearly that until it changes policy, the U.S. must be isolated and disempowered from peacekeeping as much as possible. The U.S. peacekeeping trinity is partiality, maximum use of force, and racism. Mm. And that was apparent long before the current U.S. leader, who touts it without apology. Uh, in a 1994 presidential directive reads like this, the U.S. will not support in the Security Council proposals for U.N. involvement in situations where such involvement is not viable or when it would interfere with U.S. interests. Mm. Peace operations cannot and will not substitute for unilateral or coalition action when that is what our national interest requires. Wow. Now that was Clinton. Can you imagine how that directive reads today? Uh, so uh, another lesson from Rwanda that's very important to the issues that confront us today is that <clears throat> if the intervention is to have a military component, even if the mission is humanitarian and impartial and committed to minimal force, it has to have sufficient training, equipment, and capability to defend itself and to intervene when atrocities are committed in its presence. And I've left out in the interest of time a number of times when peacekeepers have had to stand by and watch wow. civilians be slaughtered. Uh, since black lives didn't matter in Rwanda, that puny 2,500 person contingent was helpless in these two matters, defending itself and preventing these atrocities. Uh, the poorest nations came from, uh, contributed the troops to the mission, 26 countries. They often had no personal gear, uh, their vehicles were not serviceable, uh, and although English was the uh, official language of the peacekeeping mission, there were exactly two people, the Canadian general and his deputy, who spoke English as their first language. And that raises stark questions for today. What shall be the number, nationality, and capability of a peacekeeping force? Surely not the Rwanda model. But is that the, is the only alternative troops from colonial countries? And the need to address the issue of racism was highlighted in another aspect of Rwanda and of a concurrent mission in Somalia. As the black toll, death toll, began to pass 100,000, the U.S. adamantly resisted and demanded the withdrawal of the peacekeeping force. And the Security Council cut the force to 270. Uh, and as this was unfolding, the Hutus uh, captured a contingent of Belgian soldiers and tortured, mutilated them, and murdered them. And the Belgians said, we've had enough. We want, uh, we want out. So where white lives were involved, big policy change. Dallaire was ordered to make evacuation of the Belgians his top priority. And the UN then sent in a, a thousand fresh, well-equipped French, Belgian, and Italian troops to conduct, to conduct the eva uh, evacuation. And some of those Belgian troops who were drafted to uh, get the Belgians safely out of the airport had to leave a mission where they were in charge of protecting 400 Rwandan men, women, and children. As soon as they went to the airport, the Hutus came in and slaughtered all 400 of them, men, women, and children. Uh, so, uh, Meanwhile, in a concurrent mission, there was a Canadian example of the folly of letting the U.S. take the lead, and also, unfortunately, of the important, uh, important need to train and constrain peacekeepers. Uh, the U.N. operation in Somalia had Security Council authorization to disarm warlords in a civil war that killed 350,000 or so people and address a famine 
that left most of the country malnourished. Uh, and the UN turned it over to a US-led task force of 38,000 troops, two-thirds of them US uh, soldiers. But when one of the warlords shot down a US helicopter, you may remember Black Hawk Down, and dragged the soldiers through the streets, uh, the US decided that maybe cut and run wasn't such a bad thing uh, after all, uh, especially since it was only Africans who were being protected. So another lesson from that, uh, that mission was that the Canadian contribution to this force was the Airborne Regiment, later disbanded because of its members' war crimes. Uh, they included gunning down two unarmed men who'd breached the security perimeter after Canadians put out food and water to attract them. But worse was the 1993 torture murder of 16-year-old Avatar Aron, who was caught going through abandoned junk. Eighty paratroopers, eighty Canadian paratroopers, heard his screams and one later remarked, we haven't killed enough niggers yet. Canada whitewashed that scandal, but disbanded the Airborne Regiment. So finally we come, in yesterday, and it's leading to today, uh, Afghanistan, the peacekeeping bait and switch. We, we, are, we generally acknowledge that we went to war in Afghanistan, so why are we talking about Afghanistan uh, in, in a peacekeeping uh, matter? Uh, Canada went to war in Afghanistan, so uh, why are we talking about peacekeeping? But a Canadian military hierarchy, envious of the U.S. and very closely integrated with it, got us into full-scale combat. And the way they did it reveals a formula for converting peacekeeping into war making that has not gone unnoticed by Canada's generals today. And it's really the impetus for me wanting to do uh, this uh, event today. Those generals are deeply integrated with their U.S. counterparts and obscenely envious of the very vast array of toys that the uh, U.S. military <coughs> has at its command. They have no interest in humanitarian peacekeeping. Well-known General Rick Hillier was very uh, candid about that to his credit. He said, Canadian forces are not a social service organization. Their job is to kill people. Uh, so here's the formula that worked for the US and the Canadian military hierarchy in Afghanistan and is at work today for Mali, and for other proposed peacekeeping missions. <clears throat> First, appeal to who Canadians think they are. Peace-loving humanitarians, right? I mean, that's who we think we are. Uh, so after it plainly violated international law by attacking Afghanistan in 2001, bombing civilians, the U.S. for the first time invoked the one-for-all, all-for-one provision of the NATO Charter, uh, which meant that uh, Canada was drawn into uh, the conflict. But early on, uh, Canada had already uh, made a small commitment, four warships and uh, units of the JTF-2 Canadian Special Forces. They didn't bother to tell, the government didn't bother to tell Canadians about that, but they had made that minor contribution. And keep that in mind when we talk about how we're starting out in Mali. Very, four warships, uh, and the JTF. That's all we were doing in Afghanistan. But then we got invited to, to send troops, but not for combat. We were to be part of a quasi-peacekeeping force known <coughs> as the International Security and Assistance Force, ISAF, in relatively safe Kabul. And the defense minister described this mission as a stabilization mission to assist in opening corridors for humanitarian assistance. Who could be opposed to that? And Prime Minister Chrétien at the time described the Canadian Force's main role as to make sure aid gets to people who need it. Of course, we don't want to get into a big fight there. So that was our invitation to move from a token to uh, troops, but not, but not for war. Second prong of the formula. Once the troops are there, using the undue influence of Canadian generals in concert with threats and cajoling from the United States, get them into combat on the side that the West has chosen uh, to support. 
So Hillier, at the head of ISAF at the time, was facing the end of his mission and a drawdown of the troops. And he openly deceived Prime Minister Paul Martin. Mm -hmm. And he got approval for a plan that eventually put troops in the heart of combat in Kandahar, the most dangerous region. And soon, the only coalition troops who were actually in the middle of combat were from Canada, the UK, and the US. Other European nations had enough sense to say, we ain't going to Kandahar. Uh, so, at the same time, uh, the U.S. wanted to free up its forces to bolster its illegal war in Iraq, and that is generally why uh, they drew us in, uh, and, uh, and why we owed them, according to the, uh, uh, we didn't go to uh, Iraq, uh, and didn't send troops anyway, so the Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs acknowledged this and said the U.S. Uh, about the U.S., there's a limit to how much we can constantly say no to the political master in Washington. Mm -hmm. All we had was Afghanistan to wave. On every other file, we were offside. Now let that think in, sink in for a minute as a reason to put the lives of young people, military and civilian, in, in danger. Mm -hmm. uh, we owe them one because we didn't go to Iraq. Mm -hmm. Openly acknowledged by mm -hmm. Canadian government. The third uh, prong of this formula, which is I see at work today, uh, is employ humanitarian propaganda to justify the new combat reality. Uh, and in the later stage of Canadian involvement, before the U.S. said it was okay to get out in 2014, uh, the propaganda justification was that we were there to build schools and hospitals and protect women and girls. And there's a beautiful, that was part of the reason, and that's what many good Canadian soldiers tried to do. But that's the message of the Afghanistan Memorial here in Victoria, which is right around the corner. Any passerby sees that. Why are we in Afghanistan? Well, we were there to help the troops, mm -hmm. to help those little girls. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not quite. The warlords that were chosen by the West were every bit as bad, if not worse, in the area of women's rights and, uh, and mistreatment of women as the ones uh, that, that the West chose. And the bottom line of it all was civilian death and displacement, including women uh, uh, and girls. And at the same time, Hillier, oddly enough, that this message which prevailed was going along, Hillier was going around <coughs> to uh, reassure Harper's hardcore that we really were in Afghanistan to kill those detestable scumbags who were, who were threatening Western civilization. But this is the theme, the, the propaganda theme that went on. So, brings us to today. Uh, with one exception that we'll talk about in a minute, we talk about peacekeeping today. Supposedly fulfilling a campaign promise to return Canada back into peacekeeping. Uh, we are at the moment, what, 43, did you say? Yeah, you know, 43 peacekeepers, so. so out of 92,000. So, right. Out of what? 92,000. Out of 92,000 around the world. So, we're, so the government promised upon being elected to return Canada to its proud tradition of peacekeeping. <clears throat> so we are now going to be part of a, a small part of a 13,000 troop contingent in Mali. Uh, <clears throat> and in my view, this mission is simply war making false name. I don't know if you uh, uh, could locate Mali on a map. I couldn't when I started all this, so that's the reason I at least give them some idea of, uh, of, uh, of Mali. Uh, it is uh, the Mali Civil War. Mali is a poor country, very poor country of 18 million people, a former colony of French West Africa that gained its independence in 1960. And after drought, famine, military dictators, elections came about in 1990. But, but the Tuaregs, a tribe uh, in the north, felt excluded. Uh, and uh, compare Iraqi Kurds, Rwanda Tutsa, Tutsi, Iraqi Sunni, <coughs> you've got uh, a component that, that that feels left out, and they started a rebellion in the, in the 1990s and the 2000s. Uh, and so there's a matter to be decided among hostile forces in a poor country in French West Africa. How did it get to be 
uh, of interest to the West uh, so that we can go to war on one side uh, and, uh, and get help from what we call peacekeeping. And that came from the Tuaregs being armed and joined by Islamist militias and Gaddafi's Libyan forces. So the fall of the Gaddafi regime uh, <coughs> opened the weapons spigot and the civil war now has a side that the West favors, the ones that are not the Islamists. Mm -hmm. uh, French troops intervened right away uh, in, their, in 2013, and there have been so-called peacekeepers ever since that time, uh, at the direct request of the Western-dominated UN Security Council. And 169 of those peacekeepers have died. Most Tuaregs, on the matter of consent, and Mali, the Mali government, signed on to a shaky peace deal in 2015. But the civil war rages on against other Tuaregs and those Islamists, who are of course condemned as jihadist enemies of, West, of the West, whether they pose any ex existential threat to those countries or not. And at its core, this is just another part of the West's phony, never-ending global war on terror. And up to now, the West African terrorists have not, con have not uh, targeted any Canadians. Uh, <clears throat> that could change, and one can understand why uh, it might change. So Canada's commitment, very minimal so far, two Chinook helicopters for medevac and logistical support, raises a question with me, uh, what's the medevac priority. Who gets medically evacuated first? Uh, also, logistics in my day included what was called POL, petroleum oil and lubricants, as well as parts and ammunition. So is that part of the Chinook's logistical support? <clears throat> the commitment also includes four Griffin armed escort helicopters. Escorting what? The Chinooks? Uh, when the Germans and the Dutch were involved in this mission, they used their armed escort helicopters as combat support uh, for the side uh, chosen by the West, the, uh, the Mali government. 250 personnel staffing and maintaining the choppers, but the exact makeup is unclear. So more of the troops and mo most of the casualties, most of the troops and, and casualties have been from African nations, once again, like Senegal, Tonga, Burkina Faso. None of them want Islamists to be a force, democratically or not. Egypt is a big contributor to the peacekeeping force. And you may recall uh, <coughs> that there was a democratically elected uh, government in Egypt a while back called the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, that ousted a, the Western favored dictator. And uh, a coup has taken care of those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so another reason for consent from the Mali government on one side is, its interest, is the interest of its rich in keeping this chaos going. There's money to be made, I'm not exactly sure how, uh, from uh, refugees going through uh, Mali, trying, trying to get uh, uh, to the West. Uh, and uh, there's also a thriving business in cocaine. Uh, and the president is running for a re-election uh, next year. So if Canadians are killed in Mali, whatever they've died for, it won't be peace. And a similar war on ISIS and in Syria, a U.S. creation killed thousands of civilians. Uh, the Pentagon has recently admitted that it doesn't know how many. Uh, it will never know how many civilians uh, have been killed. So finally, a better, and I apologize for it, but I swear I timed this thing out and it wasn't this long. I apologize. But finally, a better vision for Canadian peacekeeping. Canada has also offered the UN 200 troops to be permanently available. And that's an idea that's been around for quite a while. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about what I think is the promise of developing that, that commitment instead of what we're doing now. But if peacekeeping is at all to be characterized by impartiality, uh, and if the military component is committed to minimal use of force, and if the peacekeeping operations are to be driven first and foremost by humanitarian goals, then several things have to happen. And the most important is to cease being a willing arm of the U.S. military, 
uh, whether under the guise of UN, the NATO, or other coalitions. Now, we have looked at uh, impartiality. Minimal use of force, what does that mean? What is actual self-defense? Uh, there is a uh, uh, provision in the UN Charter that says nothing in this charter is to denigrate the inherent right of self-defense. Mm -hmm. What is inherent? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I mean, it, it means it's just there, right? I can't point to a statute or a convention or a document or anything. It's just my right to self-defense is inherent. Uh, then how does that work? Under what circumstances do I get to kill people in, in self-defense? Is it anything I decide is inherent in my, uh, my inherent right of self-defense? Well, in, my, uh, in both of my lives, <laughs> or two of them are my lives, uh, there, is a meaning, there is an internationally accepted meaning and limitations to self-defense. Uh, and I know them well. Uh, so they mean, self-defense means that you act only in response to an imminent threat of death, not, you know, sometime down the line or in pursuit of this or in pursuit of that. Mm -hmm. You're in imminent danger. You are not the initial aggressor. That wipes out a lot of other uh, U.S. military activities. Uh, and your response is proportional force to defend only. Mm -hmm. Now as a part of this, and this is not, not without controversy, the, the accepted law of self-defense allows one to stand in the shoes of another who meets all of these requirements. And that would be the basis for by which a UN peacekeeper could intervene in an atrocity that was taking place right in front of their eyes. It would be an imminent threat. Uh, the victim would not be the initial aggressor, and the, resp the response would be there. If the, if, the, if the victim could satisfy all that, then intervention would be, uh, would be uh, permitted. Uh, Canada, in my view, could and should expand and transform that permanent standby uh, force into something that I would call the UN Training Center for Humanitarian Peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum of that training center should include training in respect for basic human rights. UN peacekeepers, including Canadians, as we've seen, have been guilty of egregious human rights violations in Somali, Haiti, and the Congo, and elsewhere. There's no way to overestimate the damage that this does to peacekeeping. Second on the curriculum for this training uh, entity that I envision is training in real self-defense mm. limitations. And third, training in the intelligent use of discretion to minimize the use of force even in self-defense. Remember Bosnia and Cyprus. So, and that there can never be a UN mandate that's sufficiently detailed to tell the troops everything that they need to do if there is a, if there's a military component. Now, Canada is too closely assigned, aligned with Western powers to be any sort of a neutral uh, peacekeeper these days. But an idea like this uh, training center, I think, would be a good contribution. Uh, and finally, the biggest obstacle to uh, humanitarian intervention uh, and what might allow Canada to make use of, of what she has learned, her people have learned, uh, and how we are not the United States. Mm -hmm. The biggest obstacle is the perversion of the doctrine of responsibility to protect. Uh, I believe that the basis of support for peacekeeping by most ordinary Canadians is the same as mine. It is concern for the lives of innocent civilians. And uh, none of what I've outlined as a way for Canada to commit to that goal is possible unless we first confront the United States perversion of the doctrine of responsibility to protect. We all agonize over, over the news of the death and displacement and torture and murder of civilians uh, uh, in conflict zones. And unlike most Americans, and I'm not afraid to say that today, I might have been several, years, several months ago, unlike most Americans, we can to some extent picture those things happening to our own family. 
and it's natural to want to do something, uh, that urge is the genesis of responsibility to protect. Mm -hmm. It's a doctrine that originated with the Canadian organization and was approved by the UN in 2005, and it goes like this. Since 1648, there's been an international norm that gives complete sovereignty to nations over their own internal affairs. But the doctrine holds, the responsibility to protect doctrine holds, that when a nation is unwilling or unable to protect its people from wholesale murder, rape, starvation, and torture, or is itself the perpetrator, mm -hmm. the international community has a responsibility to step in and protect these people. Now, what nations might be candidates today for Yemen comes to mind, except mm -hmm. that there will be no responsibility to protect intervention in Yemen because the victims are on the wrong side, mm -hmm. uh, because there's no chance of impartiality. The obstacles that to making responsibility to protect meaningful are truly formidable, and I do not mean to minimize them. Many reasonable and responsible people who, of my ilk, say the doctrine should be scrapped. Uh, I still hold out some hope. And one obstacle is the understandable claim of former colonies uh, to maximum sovereignty. Another is the understandable reluctance to have the colonizing nations return in the guise of responsibility to protect. Hmm. But the biggest obstacle is simply adherence to impartiality. Hmm. And here's where the story of responsibility to protect folds back into Mali. Recall that when the Civil War escalated with attendant civilian suffering, a flood of weaponry came in from Libya after the overthrow of Gaddafi. And the intervention in Libya that caused this to overthrow, Gadda the overthrow of Gaddafi, in which Canada participated, was authorized by the UN under the doctrine of responsibility to protect. Mm -hmm. Chaos and death were the result of that intervention. Under the influence of US responsibility protect is well on its way to becoming just another Western excuse to gain assistance in its struggle for power and influence and resources over other people's lands. And Canada is truly at a crossroads. I know that people are worried about the nuclear threat and Korea and Donald Trump and whatever. And so that's why I, I, I can't thank you all enough for showing up today because as I went through the threads of, of history and this began, these two paths began to make themselves apparent to me. Uh, I said, you know, we at least need to uh, ask people to contact your member of parliament or do something, let's, let, let's start by scrapping this Canadian participation in this Mali mission mm. and go back and rethink real peacekeeping because otherwise we're going to do a lot of what we've done before uh, that was not helpful and we are not going to make use of a storehouse of humanitarian knowledge and, and experience that could be of help in real peacekeeping. So what are your thoughts and comments? Mm -hmm. Do you, this, this training program that you were talking about, do, would you see that in the, in the military, particularly? There is, you know, I, as I was preparing this talk, is when that idea came to me. <laughs> but in the book, there, I forget who it is that, that proposes it, there is a, uh, a proposal for a, uh, a university uh, curriculum that is open to both civilian and military uh, people to, to be trained in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of approach. And so uh, my short answer is I haven't thought it through. It's a great idea in my view. I have not thought it through yet, but I intend to. Anyone else? Well, yeah. The thought flickers through my mind that we could become easily in the future a victim of our neighbor's idea of responsibility protect. <laughs> if we got too really say if we get too far out of line, you think they'll think we need to see their interest they may My bigger concern really, and I won't deny that, uh, is uh, creating enemies. I mean creating enemies. Oh. I mean, uh, I view this terrorism business as mainly a police matter, you know, a matter to be addressed by good policing, not international. Uh, so, but, but why create a whole group of people whose families have been destroyed and who tag you partially with responsibility for it 
and uh, and they don't have battleship warships and planes mm. and so forth. But they got you know they got uh, automobiles and suicide vests. Why not? Why should they not uh, target uh, you or us? So in addition to being useless, this is worse than useless to me. It has the potential to create enemies that we don't have right now. We got enough, <laughs> but we don't have them right now. Anything else? Bless your hearts for staying around. Uh, any other comments? Get some. Yes. You were mentioning that uh, some people are uh, questioning this responsibility to protect. Yeah, uh, yeah. It for what reasons? Well, there is a very legitimate uh, and fair and and respectful division within the peace community. I think it's fair to say about this whole matter of violence. I said at the outset,